Yo! You man ready to talk, yeah? <laughs> Yo, welcome back to the Detail of Mike podcast. We've got a special episode today. Well, all of them are special, but extra special today. We've got the co-founder, or should I say the founder of Detail of Mac, Mr. Dominic Ocus. So, what are you man saying? It's, it's kind of weird to be in, in this seat today. Is it warm? Is it warm? It is a little bit hot still, but no, it's good. I definitely wanted to be this side... You know, this tied of the interview so I could tell my story because obviously I've been doing this for a while, got about what 35 episodes or whatever, mm. and no one knows who I am. He's like, Who's this you that's just started interviewing bare people and bare bare? So mm. I think it might be good for you know people to find out a little bit about me. Nah, 100%. Yeah, for real. So I can't, I can't lie, like, I've been I'm looking I'm looking forward to this. Right? Yeah, before yeah. we dive in, how are you up? So how's everything going? All right, man. All everything's good, everything's going smooth, can't yeah. complain. Um, yeah, man, the same old Tottenham and shit, but we're <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, we're going through a bad time, but it happens so. Yeah, today's an interesting one because we're going to, yeah, obviously you're the founder of this and we're still very early stages and it can be quite nice for people to kind of walk through, walk with you through this journey for sure. and, and kind of get a, an outset of like who you are, get an understanding of who you are, what your vision is, where you plan on going. Mm -hmm. So like you do with most of your guests, we can kind of like take it from the top, so where did you grow up? Like, how was your upbringing? Um, let's, let's, let's go back. All right, cool. But first, if you're watching this and you haven't liked the video already, because you know me personally, mm -hmm. if you're watching this, more than likely you know me. So please, like, subscribe to the thing. You should be following me on socials and all these kind of things. You want to be diving into my life, mm -hmm. but you're not supporting the thing. Come on, man. But like you were saying, bro, so... <laughs> <laughs> Bro, like, <laughs> didn't even let like the content no. settle in. He's no, just no, 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 attacking no, no, people no, no. from early. Now, now, yeah, do it now. Yeah, you gotta let them know still. But where did I grow up? So I grew up in a place, um, East London slash Essex, called Chadwell Heath. Uh, Chadwell Heath is probably most famous people know for like where West Ham's training ground is. Mm. So we grew up, you know, not too far, maybe 10, 20 minutes, like even walking away from from Chadwell Heath training ground. Um, went to Chadwell Heath primary school, went to Chadwell Heath secondary school. Um, and just the earliest memories I remember, we used to live right close to Barley Lane Park. Anyone knows the area will know that is. And just used to go there all the time, play cage football and, and all these kind of things. But yeah, that's. that's you any good? Up. Was I any good? Yeah. Do you know what it is? Yeah. And this is going to sound mad and like conceited, but like I can't remember when I was dead at football. <laughs> Bruh. Because I started playing so early. So I started playing at like four or five like oh, super super yeah. doing early. things then i was doing mess things by six <laughs> it was kind of is mad. It? yeah yeah and obviously yeah. You, the, yeah. you you noticed that yeah, yeah 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 we're gonna we're gonna go through that but before we go into into the football like so like chadwell heath yeah. chadwell heath's you know chadwell heath romford yeah, yeah, yeah what's what's it like growing up in that sort of area like so it's funny like where we grew up it's like a mix of everything so it's like you've got like the white Eastern kind of Cockney West Ham fans. Yeah. <laughs> then you've got like the Asian man because we've got like good May Seven Kings is not too far, mm -hmm. and then you've got like the black man as well. So like mixed into all of that. So you might have like on the same road if you go down, you know, Chadwell Heath High Road into Seven Kings High Road, you might have like where you can get like your Indian food, your curries, but you also have like a yard food shop. But then mm -hmm. you've also got Toby Carvery. You get where I'm coming from. Yeah. So it's <laughs> mad. Like the mix of where we come from is right. mad. But I loved it because obviously. There wasn't really this like tension around race or anything like that. Everyone was cool with each other, and you can learn from all kind of um, sort of cultures. So like a lot of my close friends, even to this day, one of my closest closest friends, a white guy, George, close black friends, close Asian friends, like everyone's just everyone's oh, cool, man. So do, and do you do you feel like very uh, kind of not privileged, but do you see the the real advantage to growing up in a, in an environment that's very multicultural? Yeah, and you know people. You know, don't really see race as much. They kind of just, yo, he's just from the same end as me. He grows up the same way as me. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, hundred percent. And obviously, we'll get to it when I went to university, where it wasn't multicultural at all. But I even remember like some of my earliest friends. So I went to primary school. I mean, sorry, I went to nursery at Chadwell Heath. Then I moved to a school called Farnham Green, which is a school you went to. And I remember two of my closest friends at the time were two boys called Sarvan and Varanavan. So like two Asian, proper, proper Asian. Varanavan, that name's cold. <laughs> like Flavors. traditional cold. traditional Asian boys. I didn't see them as, oh, these men are Asian or these men mm. are like Hindu or mm. Sikh or whatever. These are just my brethren, isn't it? Like, mm. I grew up with. So from early, it's never really been a problem. 
for me to like have friends of other races and I could learn about oh that this is why you do this or this mm. is why you wear this or mm. you put your hair a certain way or whatever whatever and yeah. it, it was just normalized so yeah definitely I see the advantage in that mm. okay and then you um you you go into secondary school now like, so what's the what's that transition for you like going into secondary school because like Obviously, it's a big tran- It's a big transition for all children and stuff. Mm. But for you, obviously, having me at the school as well and stuff like that. Yeah. What, what was your like? How was you going into secondary school thinking like, am, am I gonna have to? So when you went into year yeah. seven, what year was you in? No, so he just left. Oh, so you I just, just left. left basically. But let's just gone. What, yeah, what, yeah. So what was it so like? So, for like, you coming so, to like, year so seven? like, let's scale it back a little bit, right? So you've got an older brother. He's five years older than you. That's sick at football. Mm. Now I'm also good at football. But going into secondary school was an interesting one for me because luckily I went to Chadwell Primary School. So almost everybody from my secondary school, it's literally a two minute walk. Oh, everybody from my everyone primary went. school is going to secondary school. Mm. And I'm, you know, without being big headed, one of the popular people because I'm good at football, but I'm also mm. like uh, good at school. Like I'm, I think I'm like a decently nice guy, like mm. I'm a prick to know, no bullying. Mm. So I was pretty popular. So going into secondary school, I wasn't really worried. Like everyone, you know, I think you have like a, a day where you go into secondary yeah, school yeah. before you actually go mm-hmm. with all your primary people. So obviously, it's me and all my friends, like yeah. 50 of us, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then a few people from the other schools or whatever. Um, so going in, I wasn't like nervous. You know, some people get nervous before they go into year seven. I was fine. However, going into year seven, I guess I was kind of naive to the fact that all of the teachers have already been through everything with my brother. So they already know, you know, the kind of family that he comes yeah. from. Blah, blah, blah. But also, because my brother is kind of and he probably won't admit it but the guy at the school who's the guy because he plays for West Ham and like, it was cold uh, yeah he was like sick. very very cold <laughs> and I remember things. I remember like teachers have got like autographs of him in the, in the yeah, classroom because they, like, they think he's about to go yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's mad it's That's so, funny. That's funny. so like obviously he's left year 11 gone to do a scholar and I've come into the school mm-hmm. so already I kind of don't have my own identity because I'm in year 7 You're in his shadow I'm already. Connor's brother before That's I'm Dominic, dark. I'm Connor's brother. Fuck. Teachers are calling me Connor. <laughs> <laughs> it's nuts. Yeah. Because we kind of look alike as well. No, yeah, yeah 100%. So they're calling me Connor and they're like, oh, sorry, da, 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 and all these kind of things. So, yeah, it was interesting. And obviously, all of his age mates are in sixth form now. Mm. So they're kind of looking after me as well. Because obviously, I'm a year seven lad. Yeah, they're coming in, in year 12, 12 at that time. 12. So they're kind of looking after me. So it was good in the fact of I could just do what I want. I could be a little bit extra tiki because I know I've got yeah, people yeah. in the older years that are going to look after me and these kind of things. But yeah, like my school experience was sick, but I quickly had to find how to make my own identity in the school. Because I went on being Connor's brother. That's dead. How, how did, did I do that? that? It's not the worst. <laughs> it's, it's not the worst. No, it's, it's, a, a, it's a, it's a, it's cool. You, I'm joking. Did, so did you not feel like some, not, okay, not pressure, mm. but at the time, obviously you're good at football, blah, mm. blah, blah. But you're good at football and Connor's good at football are two different things. And I explain why. Because where he, the stage that he's at is like, you see the stage that you're at, you're potentially going to be a good footballer. Yeah. He's already done your steps and actually got a scholar at West Ham. So Rex. now they're looking at you as like, okay, you're good. But your brother's actually doing it. Yeah, facts. So you're now looked down upon. Do you know what I mean? You're like, they think, oh, is he, is he really? Can You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Did, did that not bring its own pressures? Yeah, so obviously when you've got an older brother who's sick at um, football, but also really academically good. So it's not yeah. even like he's dead. He nah. gets Fs and that. But yeah. he's sick at football. I can just do the school thing and kind of, oh yeah, but I'm smarter than you. Yeah. He's good at both, isn't it? Um, and he's well liked. He's very popular, mm. all these kind of things. So at first it was pressure, but then I just understood that I'm not him in it. Yeah, so I've cool. got to try and cut through in my own way. And like Connor's quite an introverted person. Mm-hmm. Not introverted, I would say, but more um, like calm personality than in- I am. Introverted. Yeah. Um, Picks and choose when he <laughs> wants to be an extrovert. Yeah, but. exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I kind of just could find my way. But the good thing about it was because I felt like I was protected in the terms of like even people that were two or three years older than me looked up to him. Yeah. So then they wouldn't trouble me, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, of course, of course. So I could just kind of find myself. Mm-hmm. You know, like, sometimes in school, people will feel like they must play up to certain things mm-hmm. and do certain mm-hmm. things because other people are going to say something. Yeah. Like, nothing was really ever going to happen to me because I've got an older brother and all these people who are older than me that are kind of going to look out for me. So I could kind of mm-hmm. just do my thing. So yeah, it was pressure a little bit. 
but at the same time, you just got to kind of, you don't mm. really think too, too much about it. Like you're 12 or yeah. 13 years of age, isn't it? No, yeah. And no. you know, the only reason I asked that is because I had the same issue with my brother. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. my brother, when I come out, he's just finished mm. school, whatever. And I felt pressure. I can't lie. Yeah. I felt heated because he's like a popular guy mm. and he's loved by everyone. Mm. Like he was loved by, the head teacher knew him. And you know, <laughs> like the head teacher loved my brother. Yeah, like yeah. everyone knew him. And it's mad because obviously when he'd come into into Lee Valley at the time, his English wasn't very good. Mm-hmm. Like he didn't speak very good English mm-hmm. at year seven, year eight. I think he came he came straight into secondary school yeah, yeah. Um, at the age that we come to the country, and he didn't speak very well. So by the time he'd finished, he was popular. He was liked by everyone, boys, girls. Like everyone just loved him, mm-hmm. and he was good at football. Yeah, yeah. But he was he never like pursued the football thing. Mm-hmm. But he was very cold at football. Yeah, yeah. But then he also knew the man them. Okay. So it was a bit like, and but I never knew that side, didn't okay. it? Because like, obviously I don't know, innit? Yeah. And I've come into the school and my school was rough. Mm. It was rough. So I was like, this is, this is mad. <laughs> like, this school is actually mad. Mm. And um, yeah, I just remember like exactly the same thing that you said. Like his friends would come and be like, ah, oh, yo, yo, like little, yeah, you're his little brother. I'm like, yeah, but I don't know that I've never seen them. So I'm like, okay, cool. And then it takes a little bit of pressure off you. And then you're calm. So mm. I, get, I get exactly where you're coming from because I had the exact, exact same feeling. That's interesting. <laughs> There's stuff about the teachers. Good. Yeah. It's but um, but okay, like, so and like, just on that, yeah. not even like just, you know, first couple of weeks in year seven, like up until I'm in year nine. Yeah. Like I've been at the school two um, years now but, and they're still calling me yeah, my man. Yeah, I feel you. So, okay. But so secondary school in and of itself is, is good experience for you. Like you, you had a good time and stuff. So let's take it a little bit. Let's take a, a, a quick detour on the football mm-hmm. side of things. Yeah. So uh, how does... How does what role does football play in your life and and your family's life and how's how's that kind of cool? So yeah. from from when I can remember, obviously I was always going to football. So from young young ages, and a couple of people watching this will know, we used to play for a team called Lakeview. So I used to just be following you Sunday guys around team. Sunday league team called Lakeview that were cold at the time. I used nice. to just be following you guys around and whatnot, be on the side watching football. Football's on in the house, all these kind of things. Mm. And then I get to an age now where I can start playing. So I remember I was about five and I'm at West Ham, not at the West Ham team, but I'm at West Ham watching him because yeah. he signed at this time. And in his team is John Joe, John Joe Shelby. But his dad is the coach of West Ham, the academy team. He's got a Sunday team called Harold Hill. And he's like, oh, you know, you've got a little brother. Oh, yeah, bring him down to Harold Hill. So I went and I think I was five, but I'm playing with like the under seven, like not under yeah, six. Yeah. I was a big little kid, to be fair. Both this way and this way. I was a big little kid. Um, <laughs> and, and this way. I used to get in trouble for like climbing into the fridge and that. Yeah, I was no. doing bare messed things. Um, I like my food still. Still to this day, you can see. But anyways, so um, I got to a team called Harold Hill. And yeah, like that's kind of where I learned my trade and all these kind of things. But then also like, I remember for a couple of summers in a row, I'd go to Berlin Park. And we'd just be playing at like, five aside. But I'm playing with people like my brother's age, people like grown men we're playing against. And I'm like six or seven. So that was that like, kind of my, my training. And because I was decent at that age, they kind of wouldn't allow me because I'm young. Like I'm still getting tackled hard. Yeah, kind of yeah. thing. Obviously it trains you so that when you play with people your own age, you're good. So I remember like under eights, yeah, under eights, like we were really, really good. And um, we had a summer tournament uh, near Bill, which is not too far from here. And we won the summer, summer tournament, I remember. And it was in a final against Lakeview. And me and this other kid called Ross, Ross Dowsett, we got scouted at that tournament to go to Spurs. Uh, long story short, went to Spurs for, I think, three weeks and then ended up getting signed as an under nine. So, yeah, I got How long was you there for? So, I was at Spurs. Oh. <laughs> it's going to take us on a, on, a, on a detour here. So, I was at Spurs under nines and I think under tens. But obviously, at this time, you've got a brother who plays at West Ham. Mm. I live in Chuddle Heath, but I'm going to Chigwell to go to Spurs Lodge yeah. to train three times a week. Then going to Middleton House at the time Yeah. Um, on the weekends for Saturday training and then game on Sunday. So my dad was kind of like, well, this doesn't really make sense. Yeah, it's like, too much. It's too much. So like, I want you to go to West Ham. So they spoke to like, the academy coach at West Ham. They said, yeah, we'll take him. Obviously they knew me because I was playing against them. And then Spurs were basically like, nah. Because this was in the middle of the season. So Spurs are basically like, nah, like, don't do that. So I think at the time, anyway, on a rogue take, my dad just took me out, kind of took me to training with West Ham, but obviously I couldn't sign no papers. Um, and they were like, oh, just come back. So I think I came back, um, finished the under-10 season, got into the under-11 season, same thing. It's just like, this is too much. 
I remember one thing that just rattled my dad, and my dad's a bit of a of a maverick when it comes to this thing. He doesn't take no bullshit. So I remember we're coming back from an away game, and we're taking one of the other kids to the game, and I can't remember how it come up in discussion, but basically, this kid had the manager's number, like he had a new number or something, and only like a few players in our team had the manager's number. And my dad kind of had a funny feeling about this manager anyway. And for those who know as well about Spurs at the time, is that parents can't watch training. I don't know if they still do this now. But at Spurs Lodge, um, you kind of have the parents sitting in the canteen and you go off and train and come back. My dad didn't like that. He was like, these kids are 11. Like, why do you need to separate them from the parents? Yeah. I kind of understand maybe there's parents who are influencing yeah, what's going on in the sessions and stuff like that. But at that young age, he didn't really like it. So he didn't really have too kind of a liking for Spurs anyway. So same sort of thing happens again where he's like, I want to take him out, I want to mm-hmm. take him to these clubs. They're like, yeah, we'll sign him. I think West Ham and even Arsenal at the time as well were like, we'll take him. Um, but what ends up happening is because I'm under contract, Spurs are like, okay, we will like basically let you go, but you have to sign saying you're not going to sign for another academy for a year. Oh, uh, under 10s? Uh, under, under 11s, 11s I think. Under 11s, under 12s. I mm-hmm. might be getting the year exact years oh right. My under 11s, God, under yeah. So they're like, listen, if you're going to leave... You can't, we're not going to let you just let you go to one of our rivals because, you know, about being big head, I was one of their better players in the mm. age group. So then basically, we're getting into this. They're either like, okay, well, if West Ham want you or Arsenal want you, they're going to have to buy you or sign a contract. 11, saying, 12, yeah, you know. Or sign a contract. Like crippling man from young. Or sign a contract that says you're not going to play academy football. So obviously, we go to West Ham and we're like, they're saying, you know, you need to buy me, basically. And the fee was like nothing, I think. It was more, I don't know, 20, 40 grand. I can't remember. But there's all these add ons. If I sign a scholar, yeah. if I sign a pro, yeah. if I play in the Premier League, if I do this, if I do that, if I play for England, all these yeah. things. Which is obviously adding it all up. So, anyway, long story short, get frustrated, sign the contract that says I go and play Sunday League football, um, and then end up doing that, doing that for a year. And then obviously, the difference between academy football and Sunday league football is it's a big difference in the only tree probably was you training in that so in that year that you had off from academy football where was you training so I was just with a Sunday team so a team so called you, balance why did you not train with West Ham I don't know I, I, honestly I, you know when you're young yeah, and you your parents yeah, are yeah. making these decisions Fair for enough. you yeah. I don't really know mm-hmm. for me the smartest probably thing would have probably been just see out that year at Spurs and then sign then, at West yeah. Ham or Arsenal or whatever maybe yeah um, but obviously when you're young you don't know you just go with know, whatever, you're, with told, whatever yeah, you're told so yeah I went back into playing Sunday league football Obviously, the, the standard's not as high, the training's not as frequent, and then I just found it difficult from there to sort of get back into the academy system. Okay. So, yeah, that was, that was kind of my journey in football. And how, how about, like... Younger years, anyway. The experience at Spurs, though, was you... Did you enjoy it? Was you playing good football at that age? Yeah, like, so... Very promising. Yeah, so... <laughs> position, position. So, so yeah, so I, I started as a centre midfielder at Howard Hill, and I think my first two years, year and a half... I was playing as a centre midfielder and I was one of the better players, I would say. Anyone who knows, it's kind of funny. Me and my mate, Mike, if he watches this, we always joke about how I was messed at that age because obviously I was like athletic, tall. Mm, striker. Like, no, no, so this is when I was playing centre mid. Oh. Then then Chris Ramsey was the head of Youth Academy at the time and he was like, don't want you to go up front. He put me up front and like <laughs> anyone who plays with me now, like I basically play now how I used to play then, which is like super aggressive <laughs> and like just part, but like as a kid, I was on that because yeah. I, I just understood that like I'm bigger and stronger than everyone. Yeah, so like I'm gonna I show just, you. I'm just, yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. So That's like, mad, so know. I'm just like pushing it past people. I'm like barging on the floor, like mm. banging it in. Like I'm just doing mad things. <laughs> like like I was a nightmare basically to yeah. play against. It's long. Like I'm grabbing people's shirt. Like I'm. <laughs> Like, I'm That's super aggressive. Legend, you know? Yeah, I'm super aggressive. If I come across <laughs> you, I'm like, I'm super aggressive. But I just, like, kind of, Chris Ramsey was kind of telling me to do that. He was like, yeah, you're like, be a bully. You're bigger than everyone. Mm. You're stronger than everyone. And yeah, you can course. play. So, like, yeah. do it. And I just took that on board and did it. So, yeah, I'm playing as a striker. Like, I'm banging in goals left, right, and centre. Like, I was well liked at the academy. At so, when, so, when you come out of that year, you go into Sunday League, mm. you never ever thought, let's say, two years down the line, mm. 12, 13, 14, you never thought I could actually. Yeah, so get back Adam, into it Adam, or anything, or was your not your dream, but did you just think, wow, like this? I don't even care. No, so at these ages, so maybe like under thirteen or under fourteen, I'd gone on trials. I'd gone on trial to Arsenal. Yeah. I'd gone on trial to West Ham, but I just wasn't 
right there. Where you need to be at. If that too. makes sense. So like, mm. I was good enough. To, I was probably good enough to get signed. If I'm being yeah. honest, I was probably good enough to get signed, but I wasn't better than what they had. Yeah, exactly. And that's and that's n- not so. People don't understand is that you might be good enough to play with these boys, mm-hmm. but you have to be better than them to take their place. And, and, why, and why would they sign you? This is such a massive. It's so mad that you said that because I, obviously I coach like younger players at youth team at youth team level 16, 17, 18. Mm. and what they don't understand is yes, you are good. But there's 50 of you already at the mm. club. Mm. There's Facts. literally 50 of you at the club. Facts. Why would they sign you ahead of yeah. someone they've already got? Mm. They're not going to... You're seen as a risk mm. because the kid that they've got there in the same position as you has probably been at the club for 10 years. He knows so the they, club. Yeah, yeah, he knows the club and they also know that, one, he'll always be there on time. He's going to give us 100%. He's not going to bring no issues to the club. He'll be there. He understands the club. When you bring someone from an, an outsider, as you would want to call it, mm. you're taking a risk. Mm. Is he going to be there on time? Is he going to bring the club to shame? Um, what's he like? What's he doing outside of here? Whereas if someone's been there five, six years, they've already turned him into what the club would like. So his social media is probably properly done. Like he's mm. not doing nothing crazy. His family understand where he's at. And these kids that are outside the game don't understand. Like they watch youth team games. So they'll watch like, I don't know, Tottenham or Watford playing on, on YouTube. They're playing their game. They're watching and thinking, he's rubbish. I can do what he does. I know I can do it. We know you can do what he does. But what's the point? <laughs> you, why would I, why would they sign you if you can do the same? You're same as him. Mm. Why? Right. And that's why they don't get. That's why you need to train harder, be fitter, be quicker, be whatever you are. You need to be so superior mm. to what they've got. So when they look at you, they go, "Wait a minute, he's what? What? He's exactly the same as what we've got, but he can pass the ball better. He can use both feet. He's stronger. He's quicker. He gets in early. Whatever it may be." And well, like this is this could be a whole segment on its own. You know, yeah, like, like advice to. To younger, you know, the and, and it's just mad that you said that because, like, you felt that at 13, 14, and you understood straight away yeah. that, bruh, I'm, I'm same as them. That's why I'm not going to get signed. Yeah. We've got boys at 17, 18, not understanding this. Do you but, know how crazy but that I was is? blessed, obviously. Like, let me not say that I just had this self awareness. I'm no, blessed no, in that. I've got a brother who's five years older than me, but I've got a dad who's very wise. Mm. So he understands these things, and he's like, you have to be better than what they've got to get signed. Mm. And he's telling me that. Yeah. But he's like, when you go into games, you need to show them. Like you can't just turn yeah. up and have an all right game. No, you, you need can't. to score. You need to do this. You need mm-hmm. to do that. Yeah, because things. you need to show them that why you're better than what they have. You can't yeah. just turn up and be the same as everyone else. You have to stand up. Of course. Why they're going to sign you. Obviously, I'm blessed in that fact that, that I to- he told me these things and I could understand them. Obviously, it's still disappointing mm-hmm. because you think that if you would have just let me go, I might have been in these teams and settled. Yeah. But there's no regrets in it. Like Yeah. So at that age now, you're thinking, let's say, not the dream's over, but at yeah. 34, when you're going to trials and you're getting knocked and you're getting knocked. So is the football, are you thinking now, okay, football's not for me? Not not for me, like I'm still going to carry on playing, but mm. my dream isn't like, Connor's dream was probably like, I can make it here, mm. I could have a league career or some sort. Mm. Was your dream, okay, football's not for me? Mm. Does your mindset change a little bit into so, like, okay, so what, when who my am mind, I? When my mindset changed, so obviously we had Frank Glock on a, on a podcast. and that's What a I'm, guy, by the way, Frank. What I a guy. Him up, and that's yeah. Frank. I met him at um, Ace Academy. So I think I joined there like under 14s and this is a, Academy to sign of boys who are just on the cusp of getting signed at academies, but just need a little extra. Mm-hmm. I've been doing a flex training, I'm doing football training. But the problem for me of going there was that we didn't ever play games. So we didn't play enough games, we weren't in a league, we didn't play regularly. So we might play these like trialist games, we play against Reading or we play against mm-hmm. Chelsea or whatever. But we didn't have enough regular games. So when I'm, so I remember under 15s, I went to Charlton. That's why I bucked up with Frank again on trial. And I was just a little bit off the pace. Like, I was probably, I was all right. I did okay when I went there. But I was just a little bit off the pace. I wasn't, you know, that match sharpness that you mm. need. So after coming off the back of that trial, so I'm in year 10 now, and I'm thinking, it's getting tough now. You see, at this point now, mm. like at that trial there, where you think, bro, I'm in year 10 now, and I've, I'm just off it. Mm. Are you going to Connor for advice? Because at this time, Connor is in the league at this time. So you're yeah. in, in and around the league, or yeah. even not even year 10, maybe a few years before that. Are you ever going to Connor for advice? Or do you feel like, no nah, man, I can't. I can't ask Connor. Like, nah, do you, do you know what I mean? Nah, so we didn't really. In terms of football and advice, we haven't really spoken about football and advice ever, which is kind of weird. But we don't really talk about. Th- but I think we had parents who were strong in their attitudes towards our football. Mm. What, what, so do you, like, what do you mean by that? Like, whatever we, we would a lot. Of, <coughs> I'd say a lot of the time when we played, we would try to please them. Okay. Like especially our dad, like yeah, he your was, dad. I remember your dad supports. He was supporting us from. He was there every as, game, every yeah, session. Every I, game. I remember him. What a guy! So like, anything he's telling me, he's gonna tell him. Okay. Anything he's telling him, he's gonna tell me. Because mm-hmm. he so can like, see it all. Yeah, he can see it all. So it's not like 
he you're gonna come to me and I'm gonna be able to tell you something so different that's that gonna be that's contradictory to him. Yeah. If that makes sense. Mm. Facts. So um but yeah, just on that, so so, so you're, wait, 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 let me just get, because yeah. this is like, this is mad, because yeah, what you're saying is club, he's at, in a big club, mm. doing well, flying, because he was the top dog at West Ham, and he's n- like, I know what you're saying about your parents and that, but you've never gone to Connor and said, Connor, like, oh, what's training like, or what's finger, what can I do, or, you know, nothing, you just thought, I'm on my own journey, he's on his own journey. Or well, like, people can talk or they won't, but I can see. So if he's doing extra training, and he's at that, so yeah, I remember from young. But it's also I, like, gun. I also think that like I'm doing I'm bugging out at West Ham like when you're at Tottenham you're bugging out at Tottenham so like there's not much to talk about <laughs> like we're both doing mad stuff yeah no I hear so, that like, but, you know when he, but when he comes out at that age in and around that age and don't you feel a certain way of like I need to help my brother get back on track kind of thing do you know what I mean or do you like I just think it's a bit like I had the same problem as well like with my with my brother mm-hmm. and the reason I train 10 times harder because like the, the school situation, when I went into school, my brother was the guy at football. No one is better than him. Mm-hmm. So I'm coming in and I'm thinking, I there's like I'm competing with my brother without him knowing. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like my thing is, you see, my brother, he's loved by the family, loved by everyone. Mm-hmm. Like my mum, dad, everyone loves him. Not that they don't love me or whatever. So like he was sound a, jealous. No, not even. <laughs> do you know what it is? No, it's not even. It's not even jealous. But I look up to him. In, yeah, yeah, in like sure. I actually admire my brother. I can't even lie mm-hmm. um, because. He's got a personality. Yeah. I'm my personality and him are two different yeah. things. Like I might be a big person around my friends or whatever. When it comes to my family, I'm very quiet. I'm very yeah. like I just keep myself to myself. Yeah. They don't know what I'm going through, what I'm doing. I just I'm very quiet. I help my family. But my brother, he's like the life of the family. Yeah. He gets everything. When he's in the fact, like he's just the guy in it. So I'm obviously young seeing that and I'm looking at him thinking, he's actually the guy. <laughs> like I want to be like him. So when I'm going into school, he's already the guy and I'm thinking there has to be something where I can excel in to, to have a conversation with my brother. So even like when we were talking about the PlayStation thing, yeah, yeah, like yeah. even that he's cold. I'm thinking, <laughs> this, is, this is mad. I've yeah. got no chance here. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. like even when I'm going into school, it's not even me competing with my teammates. I am in my head, I need to be better at my brother at something. Mm. And academically he was smart <laughs> and I was, I was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So bro, I, would, I remember like you're 78 and I am training because I want to be I want my brother to watch me. He's never seen me play. To what he didn't even know anything about me. Even when I was at Arsenal, he never watched me play mm. because I knew he thought I ain't good. Mm. So I'm training these hours to show, like, yo, look at me, look kind at of. Me, do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. that's what pushed me to compete and be better. Mm. So it's, I just find it a little bit. I don't know. It's different to hear that that you didn't ever think like you know what my brother's here. Yeah. I need to. So to be honest, if I'm being completely honest, a little some of it was probably ego. Mm. So like at 14. I'm like still kind of in his shadow mm. and I'm annoyed about that. Yeah. Cause I still think like if I don't have an older brother, then I'm fine. Yeah. But kind of people see me, oh, he's not as good as his brother though. This oh, is, not, it's and not, it's not a nice not feeling. feeling. It's, it's not, not as good as his it's brother. It's not a nice feeling. Like Dom's like, oh yeah, Dom plays for the county or he does this yeah. or whatever. But no, he's not a West Ham, is he? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like that was, that was annoying. And maybe that's a little bit of ego. Maybe I could have leaned on him a little bit more, but like it's not like he wasn't supportive or like no no of course no no I get that things, they, obviously they support you but yeah I probably could have gone to him more but th- like he says there's nothing that he the, inf- the information that he was getting is the information that I'm yeah. getting so yeah of course yeah it's, it's all coming from the same place mm-hmm. okay so that's that's a bit about the football so you come to you know towards the end of secondary school mm-hmm. and football's not you know panning out pe- perhaps as a strong career choice. Um, you do something quite interesting in that you you're able to leverage that football experience that you've had since you were five. Mm. Let's be let's have it right, um, and do something that not many people have the opportunity to do or have done. You leverage that football to get yourself free education in what some people deem the greatest country on the planet <laughs> um, via a football scholarship. Mm. So do you want to talk us through like that experience and yeah. and how that come about? So I was always academically good in school, and I think that's that's a Let, let's not say good. Let, don't play it down. Exceptional. Like I was, I was good in school. Like what was your grade? <laughs> GCSEs, I got like two A stars, six A's, and a B. I think. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, but that's, this is what I mean. Like he's like to within like your I don't know your friendship group or your mates or whatever mm. that might be normal. That's not normal. You know that, yeah? Mm. Because the, the grades that are set out for everyone is just pass. Mm. It's a pass thing. You're getting A stars and A's. Yeah. 
That's not. I got A star at maths, which is kind of messed. Yeah, that's not. That's, that's <laughs> it's not kind good. of messed. You're except. <laughs> you know, if you got A star in maths and failed everything else, you're still exceptional. You yeah. know that, yeah. yeah so yeah. like, don't play it down. You was a clever kid, and that's like that's that shows a testament to your family, the way Facts. they brought you up. And Connor, I'm, I swear, I remember your grades because when we was at West Ham, we had to bring our grades in, and I'm sure you got A's as well. Yeah, my team was patterned, but, yeah. but and it's also, it's also let's have it let's have it right again. Like we worked hard for them. Yes, mm. like. There was a couple of people in my year who were c- very clever and got good grades, and I don't think they worked that hard. Like mm. they genuinely were naturally yeah, clever. Yeah, you can be. Yeah. Outing is we were doing mad practice papers. Mum was printing off mad yeah. practice papers oh, and saying them. you need to sit down and do the exam. Like at yard, like yeah. we're we're working very hard to get them. So in my life, and uh, maybe you're the same. Like we we've always had to work hard to to achieve to achieve good things mm. like to be clever it's hard work yeah and man, i think like that obviously we're, we're very blessed in that a lot of people's parents especially my age and your age didn't go to university mm. we're blessed in that both of our parents went to university so our mum's got an associate degree and our dad's got a master's so like Amazing. we come from stock of like very well educated foundations people. are strong the foundation is strong and it's, and it's allowed us to build on top of that and so yeah so in terms of the school thing i was always I was always decent at school. And I remember when Connor didn't get his, his professional contract at West Ham, mm-hmm. a company called Pastor Soccer approached him um, talking about that scholarship to America. So I remember when I've come back around to, I think, you know, my first year in sixth form, mm-hmm. I was speaking about, you know, what I want to do for uni and these kind of things. And I think my mum maybe brought up, oh, yeah, like, do you remember the, the scholarship thing? Maybe that's something you could explore. So I've gone through it. <clears throat> I've gone through the process with a company, a guy called Tom Nutter. So this is Tom when Nutter. you're in... Year 12. Year 12. So you're yeah. in your first year. Yeah. At yeah. Yeah. Sixth form, yeah. Um, and basically, like, going on, like, you know, this, the trial they talk about to see how good you are, yeah. to see, you know, what sort of scholarships they think you can get. Like I was saying, a guy called Tom Nutter, who runs his own prog- program now. There's one of my friends called Josh Spencer. So we're going to go and check him out. Tom Nutter Scholarships. Go big them up. Um, so, yeah, I've gone through that now. And they basically said, yeah, like, we think you're, like, one of the elite players and nice. you're someone who can get, like, a really good package to go to America. So long story short, I've got a study for something called the SAT, which is like an entrance standardized test um, to allow you entrance into America. So I do that, and then I basically get put on the portal. So that video of me and all these coaches are emailing me. I probably spoke to, and I don't want to sound boastful, like I probably got emails from maybe thirty or forty schools, like wow. a lot of schools. Wow. Um, is this because of your ed- your like results? And your ability at football, so it's, or it's, it's the it's the two I think. So I'm a pretty good footballer, but I'm also good academically, which okay. means they don't have to give me as much athletic scholarship. So the way that the scholarships work is you can get money for how good you are academically. Okay. You can get money for how good you are athletically. Okay. So I'd say someone who's not so great um, in the classroom, they'd need more athletic money. For me, they could almost split my scholarship down the middle, which is easier for them. Easier for them because oh. less money coming out of the athletic budget. Okay, okay, okay. So it's no. easier for them. So they're really, really interested. So I ended up going to a school anyway called um, West Virginia Wes- Wesleyan College. And h- how do you decide, like at sixteen, seventeen, how are you deciding you're about to you're about to move to the other side of the world mm. to a different <laughs> culture, to a different thing? You've spoken to 20, 30 different people. Your brother hasn't had this experience. No one in your family has had this experience. Mm. How do you s- decide? that this is the place for me out of all these places? So I think, and I don't ha- know how I understood this at 17, but I thought, okay, everyone my age is going to go to university. They're going to go to University of Manchester. They're going to go to Queen yeah. Mary. They're going to go to whatever it's city, whatever university is. What's going to differentiate me with me and them? Well, mm. If you look at the piece of paper, 2-1 from Queen Mary, 2-1 from Manchester, 2-1 from whatever. What's going to differentiate me? Okay. Immediately they say West Virginia Wesleyan College in America. Huh? Yeah. They see soccer scholarship. What? Yeah. Like, what's that about? It's immediately a talking point with employers. So I thought, okay, new culture, get out of my comfort zone, you know, and just go and discover something. I wasn't quite done with the football yet. I still wanted to play at a higher level and I was told that it was a good level. Mm-hmm. So I thought, yeah, let me go out there and just, just you know, took a leaf of faith, basically. So out of, so, the, so the scholarships that you decide, out of all these people you spoke to, you just thought, I'm just going to go with this one. Didn't so you look into, like, the city? No, no, the, so of course, so of course. So or the person that you spoke to, was that the person? Yeah, so what, I think... What for pushed you over the edge? So for I think that? for me, it was the communication between the head coach and the assistant coach. So assistant coach was a guy called Sam Turner, 
and he quite actively pursued me. So he like came to the showcase. Is he English or American? English from oh, Birmingham. So he's out there. Okay. So he went to the school and then became a coach. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, he's he's from Birmingham, um, and he'd come to that the past soccer showcase to watch me play. You know, sat down with me and my mum, had a discussion, and then like actively stayed in contact. And I just felt the love. Um, okay. And then when speaking to Tom and the guys at Pass for Soccer, the conference that I was going to was very competitive at the time. Uh, had a lot of English players too, um, and players from all over different countries. So I just thought, yeah, like this, this seems one. this seems interesting. Although the college was really small, so it only had fifteen hundred people total. So like, that's really small for university, mm. like similar size to a school. Um, but yeah, like I just took the leap of faith, and it seems to have paid off alright. I guess. So talk to us about. West Virginia Wesleyan like where is it in America and why did you not decide to go turn up in Miami or like in New York City or in yeah, Los Angeles options, or yeah. like so why did so you pick because so I, I, I can't remember I feel you had a couple of them <laughs> options as well yeah. so it's funny so there was a school NAIA school in Miami so there's t- there's two um, governor there. bodies I'm there. <laughs> there's two governor Miami bo- there's two governor Screw. bodies in America there's the NCAA and there's the NAIA at the NAIA school in Miami on Miami Beach that was offering me a full scholarship. And my mum was like, hell no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's done Because she knows what I'm like, you know. Yeah. Like, she knows I'm a bit of a like a social butterfly. Yeah. I'm out here. I'm not gonna read my books. It's probably it's better just for me gonna to be go. turn up. Yeah, literally. And it probably would have been if I'm being honest. So mm. anyway, I end up going to West Virginia, which is a really, really small state in America. So it's only got two million people. The whole state. And obviously the state's massive. The whole state only got two million people. It's ninety-eight percent white. Oh. super rural so like I'm talking like Crunch. I'm in the hills like no I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah but wait I'm before you go do you know all this yeah yeah I know this like the town that I'm going to union and you still went the town that I'm going to union has got 5,000 people total like I'm going to like the middle of nowhere basically yeah to go and kick ball but I went there and it was fine man like we had everything that we that we needed we had a cinema we had a bowling alley yeah, we had yeah. like you know, as much fast food as you could want. We had the Walmart. We had, like, everything. Everything that you want was there, to be honest. And then an hour away was a place called uh, Morgantown, which is where West Virginia University is. And it's that's always consistently, like, top three party schools in the nation. Okay. So, you know, in the off-season, we go up there and do... do the yeah, go and enjoy. Yeah, go and yeah, enjoy. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, like, football, um, it was interesting. So, obviously, I got there... And we've got players from all over the world. We've got players from Belgium. We've got players from France. We've got players wow. from um, Croatia, Serbia, uh, Brazil, Spain, like all these different countries coming together. And like the level was a lot better than I thought it was going to be, nice. if I'm being honest. Um, and even like players from other teams playing for like under 17 Germany, under 18 no foot, like really, really good standards. So I went out there. Um, and yeah, like it was, it was, it was a good experience. It was a good, it was a good four years out there. But the interesting thing that I don't think people know is that in America, at college, you share um, a room with someone. You don't have your own room. You know, like uni accommodation here, you have your own room, you have your own shower. You share a room with someone. Is it small? Yeah, so like probably three quarters of the size of the room we're in now. Okay. And there's two beds in there, two desks. Okay. Is that a problem? Was that a problem? For no, you? no, no, no. So luckily for me, the team I played for when I was under 18, team called Concord, one of our players, Liam, was doing the same thing. He wanted to go to America and he ended up coming to the same school as me. No so way. We already knew each other and we were just kind of cutting through. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you yeah. two, like, did you, you pick who you, like, you're living with? And yeah, stuff yeah. Like? So we said, yeah, we want to live together. Blah, 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 blah. We and were then, roommates for four years. Oh, nice. From, from so you see that, so the, you're talking about the standard of football there. Mm. What is, like, when you say the standard of football, what would you compare it to here at like under 18 level when you're there? Would you what would you com- would you compare it to academy standard or below? Ooh, that's a good one. I don't know. I feel like maybe not the top academies. Yeah. But we'd give a game to most under eighteen teams. Really? Yeah. Yeah, like because the big thing in America is like athleticism. Athleticism. So like we're super fit. We're quick. We're doing like lots of like strength and conditioning work and stuff like that. So I think maybe from a technical perspective, it's not. It's not comparable to England, but from an athleticism perspective, you like can compete. Yeah, it's good. And what were the pitches, the standard of pitches? Um, like, were there people watching? Would, would yeah, so obviously at our university, obviously because we're quite small mm. and people, you know, soccer's not a big yeah. sport there. There wasn't that many people. Depending on the evening, um, we can maybe get, I don't know, maybe up to 200 people maybe watching, which is okay. decent. Yeah, of course. 
Um, the pitches are our pitch. It depends what year you want to talk about. You know, my first year was all right. I think my second year it was okay. My third year was all right. My fourth year was shit. Um, so it depends. So we had a grass pitch, but most um, teams play on AstroTurf. You see, when you go to the other teams, have they got loads of people watching? Or is it the same as you? Uh, like so there's people? one team in our conference called University of Charleston who were like constantly in the top five in the nation in terms of ranking. Yeah. And they would always have a decent amount of people because they were also in the capital of the state, Charleston. Okay. Yeah. So there'd be a lot of people watching. Yeah, yeah. And they were sick. Like they, they're the team who had like the Germany under 17s and all these kind of. All these did kind of you things. achieve anything out there, like football wise? Yeah. So my first year, we didn't make playoffs. Okay. Um, was that a standard thing for your. your um, to not make playoffs? Not. Or to be to win or what? Or you can. What's the. St- what was the. So, um, so the history of the of the program mm. is quite successful. Okay. But in recent years, we were just average. Okay, I okay. think maybe f- four or five years before, they made it to the elite eight, which is the last eight in the nation. Mm-hmm. But they hadn't really done anything in in the previous years. Um, so my first year, we missed out on playoffs. I remember we lost one game with like three seconds on the clock. Oh my! It was mad. Um, then the second year, I was injured for the whole season, pretty much, oh. which was mad. Um, and then my third season is when we won the conference tournament. Okay. So that was that was a really good year. So we ended up, we were ranked 17th in the nation at one point. I think we only lost one one or two games in the conference. I think we lost two. No, I think we lost three games in the conference, mm-hmm. all away. We didn't lose at home in the conference. Um, but it's a funny story. So we end up playing. So I'll just fast forward to the end of the season. We've 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 qualified now, and I think we finished. I think we finished third. Mm-hmm. So it's second versus third, and first versus fourth. So we're playing the second team. So we're playing a banner. Yeah, no, I think we finished. F- I can't remember where we finished, but anyway, so we're playing. We're playing a team called a banner, and <laughs> our keeper is mash up. So like his arm, he can't throw, his right leg's mashed up, he can't kick. We're getting peppered for 45 minutes because he can't kick. Yeah. So like we're basically getting a centre half to take the goal kick. And obviously they're heading it back <laughs> and then we're just defending for yeah. 45 minutes straight. Like it's mad. Like he's trying to kick it with his weak foot. Like it's not coming out of the box. Oh. Like it's mad. Going at half time, we're like, coach, like put the put the second keeper in, but he's a freshman. So like he's a first year player, so he's a little bit nervous. Or whatever, like no, we have to put him in. Like yeah, you got what we're playing with is nuts. Like our keeper <laughs> yeah, can't throw a is... kick. This is crazy. Yeah. Anyway, we put him in. We end up winning the game three 0 Oh, nice. We go to the final now. We're playing against the number one team in the nation. They're undefeated for the whole season. They haven't lost a game. We go there now. I think maybe twenty minutes in, we go one 0 up. We're thinking we're going. To, we're playing at their home stadium as well. The finals at their mm. home stadium. Going one 0 up. And we're playing. Like we're bopping them off the park. Because we played a 3-4-3, three, three basically. And we're popping. And we're not up. We're playing, we're playing, we're playing, we're playing. They're not really doing much. We're defending really well. Everything's cold. It's a nice hot day. I'm thinking this, this could be it. Because no one's really expecting us. We're the super underdogs in this. Yeah. No one's expecting us to win. Got to the 80th minute. They've got a big centre-back French guy. Gets that goal corner. Just bang. Goal. 1-1. One, one. They're Obviously, all their fans are at home. Everyone's going crazy. Mm. Blah, blah, blah. We're going to extra time now. Basically in the huddle and we should like we're like, should we just try and play for penalties? Like defend or should we go for this? Mary the man, the whole game we've been going for this. We've been yeah. like pop, bopping them, going toe to toe. We're like, nah, fuck it, let's just go for it. So anyway, we're popping, 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 whatever. The ball's like basically pinging about between the centre back and the centre mid. It's like hit the centre mid's um that like shin pad, Kieran Bywater, who I had in the had in the podcast um back in February. It's hit his like shin pad and gone in. And we're in on goal now. So Kaz, our right wing is in on goal. He's in. And he's like, he's moving ner- He's moving a bit <laughs> nervous though. Like his legs are shaking. He's moving a bit nervous. Thinking, bro, what are you doing? Like, put it away. He's just waited. My boy Matt's just come streaming down. He squared it. Tapped it in. No. And how it works cold. in America is extra time is golden goal. Oh. <laughs> so if you score, you've won. Score, you've won. So he's tapped it across to him. Slapped it's it's in. gone ab- absolute oh, scenes. Oh my god! Absolute <laughs> like, scenes. Like, it's absolute scene. I'll show you like, the video yeah. after. Like 
I'm like, I've sp- cause I can see it's unfolding. I'm playing centre back. I've like sprinted up. They squared. They scored. I'm like grabbing oh. Matt. We've all done like a dog pile. Like some man are crying. Oh like, my day, that's mad. sick. Like, and obviously we had fans who travelled. We had like yeah. 50 or 100 people who had travelled. They jumped it? over the thing. Oh, like, that's going going off. Off. It's going And off. this is at their home pitch as well. Yeah. Oh, it's going off. So we're, we're singing. We're on the pitch for like 20 minutes after. Yeah. We're singing. <laughs> we're taking pictures. Like it's, it's mad. Um, that's that's bonkers. But yeah, we won that. And then obviously we ended up playing. That made us qualify for the Nationals. We played them again in Nationals, the same team. And they beat us 1-0. Happens. And then they go on to win the national title. Okay. So that's how good they were. They were they're a really good team. But yeah, that's got to be the highlight of, of going out there for sure. Nice. So now you've obviously completed your time, mm. completed your time there. Mm. What are you thinking when you're coming up towards the end of your journey there? Because ideally, when you first started, you thought, okay, I'll do my four years here, finish, back to the UK, yeah. see what happens. So you get to the last, I don't know, three two, three months, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to start thinking about the future. Yeah, like yeah. beyond this journey is done now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's next? What is What was in your mind at that time? So for me, understanding as well, kind of the journey that Connor's gone through with football, mm. it's a very temporary and difficult game and profession to go into. And a lot of my friends, maybe not so much when I graduated, but the year before I graduated, were talking about trying to play pro. In America? Yeah, yeah trying to play okay. for America. So there's, they've got three professional leagues. They've got the MLS, the USL Championship, and the USL one, who Paco plays in the USL Championship now. Okay. Um, so I've basically said, at this point, this is going to sound kind of mad, but I just like, I don't even know if I want to be a professional footballer. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not going to play in the Prem. Yeah. I'm probably not even going to play in the Champ. I might sweep a League 1 or League 2, and even then it might be a couple of seasons. I don't want to do the non-league thing because I know what that's like. Yeah. I don't really appreciate the way that I play football mm-hmm. and the way that I try and play football. So I was going to just like, yeah, man, this is this is it for me. I think this is this is what I'm going to sign off, sign off on a high, done my four years out there, and I'm good. So yeah, I kind of made the decision I'm either going to come back to London or maybe see what job opportunities are, are available in the, in the US. Mm. It's interesting you say that as well because, yeah, I feel like... Um, that that sentiment is not that well understood by a lot of people mm. around people not wanting to play football. Mm. Like we had Shabazz on earlier, and he was just he was like, "I don't want to play ball in it." Like I had someone like talk to me yesterday and say, "Oh, like the idea that he didn't want to like keep going with it rattled him because mm. he's like, well, how can you not want to be a f- professional footballer it don't make sense mm. but like when you don't want to do something like <laughs> sometimes like it's not all about when you see the flashing lights and all this yep. kind of stuff like not everyone's on that in it mm. some people actually can see their life without football in it yeah. even if you're around it exactly exactly so yeah that was the kind of thinking for me i was just like look i'm a good footballer i've had a good ride with this thing mm-hmm. like at 22 what's that 17 years yeah like, i've done my time I've learned a lot. I've met some amazing friends. I've done some sick things. But, you know, everything runs its course, right? Yeah, of so course. I was just kind of like, yeah, man. Um, in terms of playing football at a high level anyway, I think so I'm done you scrapped So you scrapped the football thing. What's what's next now? Now you're, you've done, you're about to graduate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I graduated. Um, had a had a great last sort of four or five months of, of yeah, enjoy partying and, and, and whatnot with the boys. Um and then fortunately for me, I was able to get a job to stay in America. Is that uh, something that you seek or is it something yeah, that so, landed? So I was kind of like, I'm coming home. Okay. Actually, let me, let me not lie. When I first went to America, I was like, I'm going to America, I'm coming back. Yeah. Then as time progressed, I was like, this is all right. This is cool. But I still kind of like, I'm going back to London. Mm. All oh, my family's there, where, 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 my brothers, whatever. And then it got to my senior year. And I was kind of having a conversation with my mum. And I was, she was just like, why don't you just apply for jobs out there? Just see. Because yeah, if you come back to England, you're never going back. Yeah. So you might as well just that's, see what's out fact. there. That's a fact. She was like, you might as well just see what's out there, see what's going on. So anyway, I applied for a job for the company that I work for now. Um, and it was mad. Like, I kind of applied online or whatever. Did like an online test, online interview. And it's funny. So I did the online interview. And it's one of these video interviews. I don't know if people have done them before. But it's like a question comes up on the screen. 
and they give you like 60 seconds to repair and they just start and it records you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard about so it. I'm, so I'm doing this, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I've finished it. And I've, I'm walking back to my dorm. I'm like, yeah, I flopped that. There's no chance. There's no way. Are, in they, the asking, hell. are they asking mad questions? They're like, or? name a time when you showed leadership to da 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 da. And they give you 60 seconds. You just gotta you got to think a bit off the dome. Might maybe jot down a note or two and then just say it. Obviously, you know, when you're in an interview, when I'm speaking to you, I can understand if you're taking in what I'm saying or not. You're just talking to a camera. I'm just talking to a camera. So I don't know. And then you might even be talking and it will just, because it only gives you like two minutes to answer. So you might be talking, it just cuts off or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you're just like, oh. So I thought I flopped it. Then I got an email. Da, 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 oh, congratulations, you've got through to the next day. I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, we want you to come to the office. So the office is in Washington, D.C. They're like, yeah, send us your details. We're going to book a flight for you. Oh. To fly you to D.C. to come to the interview. We're going to book put you in a hotel, blah, blah, blah. Like what? Yeah, this is mad. I was like, oh, this is alright. I thought you was applying for a job like in the <laughs> city that you was in. No, no, no. This is in DC, so it's like four hours away from where I am. Okay. Like, yeah, we'll fly you. Boom, boom. Going down to the interview, or whatever. They they seem to like me. Everything was cool. A couple of months later, they've kind of called me and said, yeah, we'd like to offer you the job. So yeah, I was working there for a year. Um, it was interesting adapting to a new city while working a uh, uh, nine to five. Um. But yeah, like I kind of spoke about this before, but in the early kind of months of being in DC is when I decided to start the podcast because, you know, I was kind of moving mad, getting before drunk. We, yeah, before we go there, so do you feel like, uh, what would your advice be to maybe to that 17, 18-year-old uh, who might have that option to, you know, go study in another country? Mm. Um did you see like the real positive benefits of being British, being black, being smart? Um, what what were that, what were those dynamics like? So you obviously you went over there um, to study economics as well. Mm. What um, what role of, of having that identity mm. did it play in you having like a nice experience over there? Mm-hmm. That's a really good question. And just I'm gonna answer the first thing you said about what advice would I have to 17 and 18 year olds. And I would say, please, 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 if you're ever going to listen to anything I say, please focus on your books and your education because it will give you so many options in later life. If I fobbed off the, t- if I fobbed off the education thing, I would not have been able to um, go to America. This podcast probably wouldn't even exist. Mm. Probably wouldn't even had the, the mental capacity to think of doing this. So focus on your education because it opens doors. Even if you're sick at basketball, you're sick at football, you're sick at, cricket, you're sick at rugby, whatever you're good at, please focus on your education because that can open doors for you. So America was was really good for me. And West Virginia, for those who don't know, it's got quite got like a southern feel to it in terms of the state. It's not it's not in the south of, of America. There's something called the Mason Dixon line and basically Virginia, you got Virginia is next to West Virginia. West Virginia separated from Virginia because it didn't want to be part of the Commonwealth. Which basically means you had the South of America fighting with the North of America over slavery, basically. They had they had a um, civil war. West Virginia separated because it didn't want to be part of Virginia who was on basically having slavery. Where West Virginia is, it's 97, 98% white and like quite Southern. So going there as a black person, you've heard of these kind of things. These are around the time where you're seeing a lot of people get shot by the police and all these kind of things. Um, going there, I was a little bit apprehensive. I thought, mm. oh, it's fine, like, it's a university, I should yeah. be right. So I went there, and everyone was lovely, man. Like, I had no run into the police. I had no sort of, like, racial mm. issues, nothing like that. But I caveat that by saying, I think people were almost confused by the fact that I was black and British. Yeah. Like, that rattled them. Because they were like, I remember, like, one of my first weeks at the uni, someone said, I can't remember if this was a basketball player or football player. It was like, hey, yo, bro, but they got black people over there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, bro. Like, like, what do you mean? Yeah, 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 of course. Like, what are you on like, about? What are you on about? But obviously, they don't know. They just think it's all like tea and crumpets and the queen and yeah, you know, yeah, all yeah, these course, kind of yeah. things. Um, so, yeah, like, it, w- it, was, it was a really good experience for me. And one thing that I always will take away from that experience is me and Liam, we're just walking around the town to just find out what it's like. I remember walking past this lady who obviously lives in the area. She's on the phone. And she's like, one second to the person on the phone. She's like, good morning. And that just like, I just stood back and I was like, that would never, ever, ever, ever happen in London. And what, just carried on? Yeah, just, back on yeah, the phone? yeah just, just say good morning to us and then just keep it moving. Oh. 
And that's the kind of pe- that's the way that people from West Virginia kind of like. They're very like community. They're oh, very okay, like yeah, nice yeah. to people and all this kind of stuff. Very inviting. Mm. And that's the difference. And coming back to 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 London, we're not warm. As yeah, as I was gonna say. Can you touch warm. on the in your experience? Yeah. Um, differences in culture from you know let's this say London. We grew up in London mm. to a place like West Virginia and even more broadly like the American. Uh, culture because like like we have you know lots of conversations you, you talk about how many of them are not that well traveled and don't necessarily know what life is like outside of mm. america mm. don't have passports don't see the necessity to have one um to know about what's going on in the rest of the world is that like quite reflective in like on a day-to-day kind of yeah so you know how and I don't know if this is for us because of football or because of just general knowledge, but we will know what the capital cities are of most of European, most of the European countries. Mm-hmm. You can probably just guess by the football teams, but most of us would know. Yeah. In America, everything is American centered. So news is all about America, but obviously America is huge. Mm. So that's not a, that's not a blame on them, but they don't really have much international news unless something mad happens like the Prince Harry and the Meghan thing or whatever. They haven't really got much international news, so they don't really know much about what's going on in the world, mm-hmm. um, which is quite sad because I think, like, even though in America you have different regions, so you have, like, the northeast, like, the Boston kind of area, you have New York, you've got down south, like, Texas, then you've got, like, the Midwest, like, Chicago, then you've got the west, mm. California, all these, and all these different places have these different identities, but they're all broadly similar. Whereas when you travel outside of the US and you go to other places, you understand what different cultures are like. And I feel, feel like a lot of American people, because they're in the greatest country on earth, are kind of blinded by what life is like in America. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, though, when I was in West Virginia, like, and I think it's more of a Southern thing again, is that people are so inviting, man. Like every holiday, so we used to have Thanksgiving in November. Every Thanksgiving, I had offers. Oh, yeah, come to mine. Like, you haven't got anywhere to stay? Oh, yeah, come to mine, come and eat. And Thanksgiving is like a big thing. It's kind of yeah, like yeah. a second Christmas. Come and like eat with my family. Come and stay with us. Come and oh, do all these things. Sick, man. That's cold. And like, I feel like if, I'm never going to lie, like if someone come from America to here and we had we have a Christmas or something, I'm not really going to invite a man nah. to spend Christmas with me. Even though maybe I should. Maybe I should yeah, be more yeah. inviting mm. if I have that friendship. Well, it's not the culture It's here, not the culture yeah. here to, to do that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I'm thinking, why not? Like, mm. this person is just away from home. They're either going to be sitting in the university accommodation by themselves or they or can they enjoy the holiday with you. Mm. And if they're your friend, why wouldn't you do that for them? Yep. So that is the good thing about being out there is that people are so lovely, people are so inviting. Because even like, when you used to say, oh, like this family have like invited me for like, Thanksgiving, I'm looking at him like, what? what are you, are you <laughs> yeah, like that's weird. That's yeah. that's sounding weird to yeah. me. But then obviously, like when you when you deep it, it's nothing weird nothing about it. Nothing weird nah, about it's it. It's just being open hearted, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, so that, that, that is the thing about it. Mm. Like everyone was lovely. Um, I think people didn't get me culturally a little bit because like it was funny that like, people would say like I've got like a <laughs> I've got like a urban proper accent. If that makes sense, because obviously they're not getting. The way that I sound, I sound like obviously British, but I'm from London. So I've got a little bit of the swang, the, the slang and the twang kind of thing. So they, mm. were, they weren't really getting it. But then also like the kind of music that we listen to, but then I'm wearing mad skinny jeans. Yeah, it's, like they're it's just too not, much going on. They're not getting like the, because obviously over there, they're still wearing quite baggy jeans yeah, yeah. and all these kind of things, yeah. like especially early when I first gone to uni. Like still yeah, you was in jeans. the jungle still. They're still wearing like baggy trousers and yeah. all these kind of things. Like it's all mad. Um, but yeah, like overall, it was a good experience. Um, yeah, and you'd recommend it? You would recommend oh, it? Oh, 100%. Like 100%. Even if you're going to go and come back, like I would 100% recommend. But only if you're going to study, though. So like there's there's um, regulations put in place that if you're like failing all your classes, you can't play. Mm. And I think that's a good thing. Is that, you know, if you go and play top level sport in America, you come out with an education... And, and you can still go and play professional. So mm-hmm. all these guys who play basketball or play American football, if they don't end up making it, they've still got a degree. I think that we should be doing something similar here. But if you don't make it as a professional footballer, you've, you've still got, got a degree. To fall on. Yeah, yeah. But here, you know, you kind of do your, B, your B-Tech or whatever during, yes. during your scholarly years. But even then, like, how well is it enforced? You're kind of yeah. just doing it to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Mad. So yeah, like I would hundred percent recommend it, and it's definitely one of the best experiences that like, of my life so far. I met a lot of cool people from a lot of different parts of the world and all these kind of things. So yeah, like sick experience, man. So now you've moved into this 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 job that you're you're at mm -hmm. at the time. Now you've got your own place. You're living alone. Mm. Just before just before we finish, how yeah. how how does that go? So I've always been kind of independent because you kind of have that training from being independent at eighteen. Yeah. So even though. You know, we had a cafeteria. We'd go and get our meals. I wasn't cooking for myself for the first three years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm by myself, right? And I'm five hours behind home. So if I need to, if if I have a problem at 6 p.m., I can't get advice from him or I can't get advice from my mum or dad until the next day. Everyone's sleeping. So you kind of have to figure stuff out yourself. You kind of have to be, stand on your own two feet and kind of figure it out for yourself. Yeah. So now when you transition that into living in a city, I already know how to, you know, iron my own clothes, wash my own clothes, cook my own food, all these kind of things. So I didn't really struggle to live by myself. And on top of that, I wasn't completely living by myself. So it's me and my friend Mason, who mm -hmm. I went to uni with. As well, living together. So it was cool, man. I quite liked it. I quite liked having my own space and kind of, you know, I had a, I lived in a really nice building that had a pool and had a gym in it and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So it, like, it was nice and it was nice just having the freedom just having the freedom, really, yeah, man. So you're, so you're in this place now, you're thinking, I've got a job here. Do you, are you looking at it like, this is, I'm... I'm yeah, this is I'm, calm, I'm, man. I'm not going back to... Yeah, I'm like, here for the next, come. I don't know, five I'll years, be honest, six years. I'll be so real. I did not want to come back to London, man. So what happened? Why Why? why are you here now? <laughs> why am I here now, boy? <laughs> 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 Only God knows. Um, yeah. But no, so how it works is, there's there's it's very difficult, and, and anyone watching this who's tried to get a visa to America will know this. It's very difficult to get a visa to, to work in America. Um, and just just let me caveat that first. With In America, there's kind of this anti-immigrant uh, like narrative. And they're like, why don't you just go the normal route? So all these people who are jumping over the border, under the border, from Mexico and running into America, they're like, why don't you just do it the normal way? So like, you know, apply. And the application process to work in America is a myth. The whole thing is a myth. So, I, so I'm so i someone with a college degree. I've got a quite high GPA. I work for a big company. I'm having to apply for a visa called a H-1B. Anyone who knows what the H-1B is, the H-1B is basically um, 65,000 people total can get a working visa, specialty occupation, working visa to go into America. 65,000 of all the applications. Obviously, more than 65,000 people apply. So they st start a lottery. So they randomly select. Yeah. So, so they randomly select wait, what? applications. Yeah. So there's a lottery, an online lottery to randomly select people who are eligible to apply. So your company can do nothing for you. They, they so can you submit me to the lottery and that's it. And it's up, it's up so to the big man. No way. Yeah, so man. what? <laughs> oh, and how, how long does that visa last if you... So, so if I was to get it, it would last three years and can be extended once. So you can have it for a total of six years. Who who can extend it? So like the company. So if the company still want me to work yeah. there, I want to work there. But to get the visa in the first place yeah. is the problem. Yeah, basically. So so you being having lived in America for the last four years, mm. studied five in the years. country, five years, <laughs> studied in the country, yeah. done all of that, mm. doesn't matter, doesn't matter. really. You go into the lottery, same as anyone that's so basically. If I've come, I've yeah. applied. We're in the same boat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not based off. <laughs> that merit, is yeah. a bonkers. Yeah, I think they're actually trying to change it. So Trump, before he went out, he's trying to change it so that it's based on how much you earn and like all these kind of things. What it's you've done more, in the country yeah, and stuff like that. Stuff. Because that's I, I find that a little bit unfair, really. Because if I've oh, just man. decided oh, I'm going to go to America and you've been there five years, got the job, you're in the, you actually you was in the job. We've still got the same chance. Yeah, but mad. That's bonkers. Yeah. So, and then so the lottery happens yes yeah, so the lottery happens and they tell me yeah unfortunately you haven't been selected so how long have you got now before you return so i think this was it? in march and i had to my visa expired on like july 10th so i had to be out in july so i had a couple months yeah i could obviously get my stuff together and, and now what's the what's what's your what's mindset when you find out i've not won the lottery <laughs> 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 what, what's the so, plan now? so luckily kind of when i was offered the job they said we'll try and get your visa extended but if not We'll send you to the London office because obviously I work for a global company mm -hmm. that's actually headquartered in London. So they said, We'll just send you back to the London office, you can work there. So obviously, you're not without a job. Okay, nice. So, yeah, they just said to me, Look, you know, you haven't got this visa, we'll get in touch with the London office and we'll get you put placed there, no problem. 
Um, and that's what they've done. Was that smooth, yeah? Like, yeah, everything the, was smooth. He wasn't ever worried like, oh, they're playing around with me. They might no, do this, they no, might no. do that. The only thing is, is obviously the, the wage situation. So obviously they pay a lot more in America okay. than they do in, in England. For the same role? For the same role. Wow. I've had to take a little bit of a pay cut, which, which wasn't nice. Mm. Obviously I live at home and all these kind of things. So, you know, financially I'm still cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was just... Bit of a sore one, the first project, <laughs> 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 and then yeah, just to, just to, f- to finish, then so, um, you you are home now, mm. and uh, what is the light bulb, light bulb moment, but what is the moment you think you want to start the podcast? So, I actually had the moment, you know, just after I started the job mm-hmm. in. September of 2019. September 2019. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. So, like I say, obviously, for the last 17 years, I'm known as Don, the guy that kicks ball. Don means you're at ball, whatever, whatever. I don't play ball no more. I've moved to a new city. I'm a working man now. I do this nine to five thing. Every single Friday and Saturday, I'm going out and I'm getting obliterated. I'm wasting money. I'm wasting time. Because obviously, you go out on a Friday, you have a couple of drinks. You basically wake up at one. Mm. Might have lunch, might do a couple of things, again. start drinking at six, you're finished, you wake up at two on Sunday, you do a couple of things, and you're back to work. And I was doing that for weeks on end. I'm just like, bro, I'm even nuts. Like, I even remember. <laughs> I remember one Sunday, I went out. Man's going out on Sunday, man's got work on Monday. I went out on a Sunday to Silver Spring, it was some like Afrobeats party going off. I said, oh, like, I'll just have one drink and I'm going home. You know how that one goes. I have two, I have two drinks, boom, boom, I'm vibing, I'm skanking, boom, boom. things going off. Like 2 a.m. now, and this is like 45 minutes from where I live, so I've had to get Uber back, get home at 3 a.m. Obviously, I've got work at 9 in the morning. Boom, I wake up at like 8 a.m., I'm throwing off and all these kind of things, but I still oh. had to go to. Oh, I was mad. I'm doing bare different things. So, anyway, I'm just like, listen, from the from the beginning of time, I've been a talker. Anyone who's probably watching this podcast, mm. I can talk for three, four minutes straight. Um, so, I think, okay, cool. I know a lot of people have a lot of interesting stories. From especially from like footballing backgrounds, um, I, I watch a lot of podcasts and I consume a lot of the content, but I think I can come with a little bit of a different angle. Um, and ultimately, it was just another skill. I think learning skills and putting yourself in uncomfortable positions is is ultimately what's gonna, um, you know, enhance yourself personally. Mm-hmm. So you know, starting a podcast. It was interesting. You remember? Yeah. You remember? You was one of the first guests. You remember? <laughs> was one of the first guests. We're sitting at this table here. Yeah. We've got one mic popped here in the middle. We're sitting shoulder to shoulder, and we're having a conversation. Imagine that, just just that alone. Forget it, the editing. Forget the software. Forget the laptop being used. Yeah, me. Just that we're sitting shoulder to shoulder, <laughs> talking here, but we're talking to each other. This is crazy. <laughs> but I started the podcast, and the reception was good. People are like, yeah, like you're talking some facts or like, oh, I didn't know that about this or I didn't know he did this. or, But the biggest thing for me and the thing that I love about this podcast and what I would encourage anyone to come and sit down with us is it's therapeutic. So even me doing this, I'm thinking back on all of these old memories that I've gone through, all these things that I've done. It's like, wow, man, that's, that's sick. Because how many times do you get to sit down and basically monologue your life in depth? How many times do you get to do that and sit down and reflect? So yeah, I just thought that would... Um, be a good idea for a podcast. It's called Detailed on Mac because some people call me Dom D O M, and then um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna speak the untold truth, man. We're just gonna be honest and 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 get into some things. Dope, dope. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, like if you've made it this far, you know my thing. You have to not piss me off, and you have to <laughs> like, subscribe, leave a comment. You know, in the comment section below on the YouTube and that Instagram, follow us, Twitter, follow us, all of that good stuff. And we're grinding, man. Yeah. Like, oh. just, just to add on top of that, just for the people that have been following us on our journey, you know, on the YouTube and on Instagram and all of that, just like it's it's a thank you from us. But also, if there's anything you feel we can do better and improve, mm. just tell us. We're not one of them people that, you know, if they say mm. something negative, it's a little bit like, ah, oh, they don't. <laughs> We're not, it's not personal. We know it's not personal. Yeah, we're trying to we're trying to grow like mm-hmm. everyone else is, and like we said, everything we do here is just about growth and trying to help everyone around us and us as well. Mm-hmm. So if there's anything you think we can do to improve, if we've got any topics, anything you think you know, maybe do this next time, maybe do that. Just pop it in the comments. You know, it's not Thanks. we we don't take things personal, but 
love for the support. Yeah, and just big up, like, because a lot of people will probably watch this that have been supporting from the very first episode to the first time I interviewed you or you. Yeah. Some people will have followed the journey all the way through. And we've just started, you know, we're, we're just over a year old. Um, but I've seen a lot of growth already. We've seen a lot of positive comments. So, like, I really appreciate everyone that's listening, um, everyone that's subscribing, everyone that's following, everyone that's sharing. And we're gonna keep we're gonna keep giving you this good content. So you know, just stay with us, and we hope not to disappoint. Yeah, man. So like I said again, thanks for tuning in, Dom. Thanks for you know telling us oh, your story. Pleasure, That's why I think people should really sit down and take take it in because it's someone on their journey to where they want to go. And a lot of the time, we we see the stars once they've you know finished their journey, right? And we don't know, we don't get to see what's happening in real time you don't get to see the process in real time so it can be something that you know you take this journey with with dominic with abs with myself with sasha on this journey and uh we hope to you know provide value over over the long term so that's the detail on my podcast and we'll catch you next time Bye.